Hey! Ooh. Can't forget that we went live. <laughs> Been staring at the screen for a bit. Hello, everyone. Hey. Welcome back to another Scrimba stream. Yes, very exciting stream today because we're talking all about CVs. Mm. We call them resumes. Some people say there's a difference between a CV and a resume. I've never got to the bottom of that, but anyway, that's what we're going to be talking about. Yeah. And I'm joined today by Michael. Senior software Hello. engineer and self-taught developer who has a lot of experience writing CVs and reading them. Yes. <laughs> has been on both sides of the interview table. So hopefully yes. perfectly placed to give you expert yeah. advice. If you indeed would like to get that first tech job or maybe level up as well. Exactly. Not just yeah. your beginners. Yeah, I tried to write in my own CV. I try. I learned how to not write my own CV. Read a couple of books about it. Uh, I mean, you also had a review one. Yes, and I had a professional. I paid somebody. You know, they usually say like, "Ah, oh, don't write your own CV. Hire a professional CV writer." Yep, done that as well. Uh, so yeah, I can tell you all about it um, and more. Yeah, and I even had bought like a nineteen seventies or eighties book. Just to see, you know, what was the advice that people used to give 40 years ago <laughs> about writing CV. Has it changed much? Uh, not really, no. Um, it really went for you. Yeah, it was, uh, half of that book was about how to, you know, what pencils to pick to write your CV with and stuff like that. Pencils? Yeah, because most people wrote it with, like, pens and pencils. So, wow. yeah, and they said, like, <laughs> if, you, if you want to splash out, you know, hire a typewriter to do it for you. Oh, yeah. I know. Oh. Type it up to be extra posh. Brilliant. So, yeah, I know. And in case you're wondering, who are these people talking to me on the screen? We're from Scrimba. Yes. Scrimba.com is a place where you can learn to code for free or very cheap. And we also have an immersive bootcamp project where you can collaborate on group projects and get code reviews, yes. regular workshops, all sorts of amazing things. And if you head over to our All Courses page, this is our new section. Oh, that's two courses now. Yeah. The new AI section that. on Scrimba. More to be added very, very soon. Yeah, nice. Um, sorry for the flicker. I'm not quite sure what it's doing. Like. It wasn't when I was testing it, but there we are. Such is life. Um, Solar magnetic <laughs> fields. Yeah. Or maybe it's pumpkin playing with a wire somewhere. Yeah. Our cat. Um, so hello to you all. Thank you for tuning hey, on in. Some familiar faces. Yes. Hello, hello. Well, familiar names there. <laughs> and yes. oh, Emma has been on our live stream, which you can find in our um, Ask an Expert playlist. So yes. Here we have a variety of um, tech and, well, we're all tech. <laughs> career and tech focused streams for you to check out exactly should you wish yes brilliant um if you have any questions about your cv or tech careers in general do leave them in the chat that's why we do these things live so we can answer the questions that you have but let's kick off michael yes as hiring manager can you tell us what key skills and experience hiring managers are looking for, particularly when mm. hiring juniors, let's say. Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of the time, well, like it, when, you're, when you're interviewing yourself, uh, the hiring, hiring person is usually somebody at the top of a company or some kind of engineering manager. The company is really big. Mm. So you would normally participate in a round or multiple rounds. So you would be in uh, tech screening, or you can be in uh, soft skill evaluation. Uh, you can be at CV review stage, but CV review stage is usually at relatively small companies. Uh, once the company is like over 50 or 100 people and there are multiple teams to hire for, engineers will no longer be reviewing CVs. So you would only get a bundle, like uh, HR pre-screened somebody, and you will get a bundle with like their you know what sure yeah like you will get uh, the if they apply so linkedin like the application for there or application for any other platform you know answers that they have already done uh cv you know cover letter if they included anything that kind of stuff uh so you will be evaluating that 
And the key skills that pretty much everybody is trying to answer is uh, your company or the company that is being hired for. They had uh, created a set of principles that they value as a company. Uh, it could be literally anything. You know, it could be striving for simplicity or it could be, uh, you know, disagreeing and committing. Uh, and a lot of these like short sentences, they're usually company values. You can find them on the website. And uh, generally, companies are trying to rate candidates against those key skills, key values mm -hmm. that they have. Uh, but as an engineer, uh, you are asked to evaluate against just a couple of those values to be super focused. And uh, then also, uh, you know, the ultimate question is, can you do the job? Most of the time, uh, people are not really even asking, can you code? Because people kind of believe that they will figure that out during the process. But once you once they figure out that you can code, they want to know, can you actually do the job? You know, will you ship stuff to production? And, that, and that's mostly what everybody cares about. So what's the difference between being able to code and being able to do the job? Well, uh, you can write code that uh, then never ends up in production. Uh, you can get bogged down in perfection. Uh, you can, mm. uh, there, are, there are many pit pitfalls where you will get somewhere, but you will not finish the job. And people, you know, it's like there is this phrase where it's like, is it done or is it done done? Mm. Uh, so people care about things being done done. Uh, and uh, that's what everybody who interviews you cares about as well. Ultimately, do you get things done done? Or do you leave them halfway through and somebody else to clean after you? Uh, so I think that's probably the most important thing, you know. So it kind of sounds like what you need to prove is your ability to ship. Pretty much, yeah. Reasonably, not finished necessarily, but a, yeah. not a finished product, but a finished functionality, for example. Yeah, business has a goal that it's trying to achieve, and uh, it's done through writing code. And if you write code that achieves a particular business goal, that's what business gets back. So going back to your um, idea of evaluating candidates against mm -hmm. the business values, is it worth it then uh, researching the business values and kind of spelling out how you match each one? 100%. Oh. Yes, 100%. Uh, it prepares you for the interview. Uh, yeah. Being able to discuss these values, uh, you can pretty much, I can pretty much guarantee that any interview process that is somewhat structured will have those values baked into the process. And people will have, like, as... Uh, after the interview, as an interviewer, you have, like, for example, I log into the system and then they pretty much ask you questions like, how did this candidate match this value? How do they show this? How do they show that? Uh, you know, and you have to spell out the examples that the interviewer has, interviewee has given to you through your conversation, through other things in the process, how they are matching and how they fit in the company. Uh, so, it's very, very small companies, maybe like three, five, 10 people or whatever. It, the process would be a bit ad hoc and they don't have those values, uh, but any relatively reasonably sized company with a website, and if they have those values, you'll, you'll definitely be uh, scored against them. Which brings me on to another question I had planned. Mm -hmm. Should you customize your tech resume or CV for right. every job application? Because this could get quite laborious, but is yes. it worth it? So, uh, um, usually uh, I would answer to this question, no. But nowadays I would probably say yes, because mm -hmm. the kind of the tech hiring market is not as hot as it was a year ago or two ago. So things that you could get away with before, you obviously can't get away with now. So, you know, there are questions that the answer to, the correct answer to which usually it's fluid, depending on the circumstances. And I think in this one, I would say currently, yes, uh, you should probably try to do as much as possible to fit and stand out from the crowd. So if your CV, you know, matches against values and it's very much tailored to the job application, um, Yes, you will probably get uh, further in than custom. And it's just because as a hiring manager, some people have to distinguish between multiple applications. 
And the best way to distinguish it is something that just stands out. And the way they stand out is basically you take as many boxes as you can. While, you know, two years ago, uh, the market was hot and uh, nobody was reading your CV anyway. CV lands, people just look at, yeah, is there something on it? Okay, cool. We'll go, you, we'll interview you anyway. Uh, nowadays, that's a little bit less the case, but still, it's advisable to do it. Suppose also it depends how much you want that particular job. So yes. If it's your absolute dream job, then absolutely. Sure. I think yeah. it's worth right. it. Right, even write a cover letter if you want. Sure. Yeah. But if it's, nah, I wouldn't be that happy if I got it, but it would do. <laughs> then maybe don't expend yes. too much energy on it. Yeah, pretty much. And also, uh, you know, again, two years ago, it would have been far more laborious to do this. But nowadays, um, you know, pay 20 bucks to change GPT, uh, throw the job spec into it, and then throw your CV into it, ask it to rewrite it, and then adjust it and reformat it the way you want it, just to make sure, obviously, you know, don't don't just copy paste from ChatGPT, okay? Well, this is interesting. Um, not this one. Come back to that one shortly. Uh, yeah. Jonasu, what are your thoughts about using ChatGPT to optimize resumes? Well, there you go. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, I think that to optimize it, you can ask ChatGPT questions about uh, if you give it a good enough prompt. I would suggest like research prompts. Just go to Reddit or you know forums uh, that advise you on how to prompt it the best. And once you have a decent prompt for reviewing CVs, as uh, like you know. Imagine you're a professional tech recruiter. Uh, you're hiring for this startup, and you know review my CV and give feedback. It will give you something that you can probably focus on and rewrite it. Keep, keep that prompt plus a prompt for your job spec. You get a rewritten CV, and then that's why you could probably try to keep it in single column, very easy to uh, copy paste, reformat, and stuff. So once you can do that, job done. So it will be much easier to reform those, but always, always read it and be happy with the thing yourself. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you can spend, you know, I understand it's a pain, but if you do, for example, you know, 20, 30 minutes per job application, uh, that's probably good enough. And if you do, you know, two, three, four of them a day, you know, that's a couple of hours a day. I understand it's a pain, but it's, you know, better than not applying for anything. It's better than not getting your CV screened at all. So there's some bang for the buck. Yeah. Cool. Alex the Kid says, just uh, saw a video on using chat GPT. There you go. That and seemed like a good idea. So yeah. the resources are out there for you to check Yeah, exactly. Um, and there isn't really any particular science to it, uh, as long as you get some kind of result out of a prompt. Fair dues, prompts you. Good. Michael Lim was wondering, is there a concept of being overqualified as a developer? Like, can you have too much experience? Ooh, interesting. Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. Like, uh, we did have a candidate who used to be a CTO, and he worked for, as a CTO for quite a while. Hmm. Uh, and he applied for a senior developer job. Again, that was kind of uh, back when the market was still high. He just fancied change of scenery. Um, I don't really remember exactly what happened to him. Uh, but at the time when I was uh, like reviewing his written statements and answers to questions, uh, I think that the panel just decided that he might just be a little bit too bored with that much experience and especially high management experience it would just be a little bit too bored uh but you know once i had it over i don't really know the insight into the uh the actual application so what to do then if you feel that you might be in that category uh honestly just remove from your cv <laughs> like that that's it like your your life experience, nobody's gonna take it away from you. And uh, if you think that particular aspect of your CV will be uh, taken in the light that might not be the most favorable to you, you can just remove it. You know? And this expands a bit on um, 
It's not lying as such, you know, it's just like certain, you just deem that this experience is not relevant to this job application and you have tailored your CV accordingly. Yeah, so if you're transitioning from another field into tech, for example, your mm. previous jobs can definitely be exactly. useful and applicable, but they might not all be. So you don't have to list, you know, every mm. single job you've had. Oh, once I was a football mascot. Or <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could have been like, I don't know, some kind of, uh, you know, biological lab researcher or something, and uh, you're applying to be a UX UI designer. Um, there are some transferable skills, but, you know, if you have a decade of, you know, academic experience across universities and labs, you just condense it into one thing and say, here are all the transferable skills, and I was like, like one line, what you did before, and that's it. Because... It, it's not important to them. Yeah, it's about showcasing the most relevant experience. Yeah, exactly. Quick question here from Isha. Could you explain the difference between a resume and a CV? And <laughs> okay. Michael Limba also <laughs> says, when did CV become more prevalent term than resume? In the US, I've always used the latter. Is this a regional thing? Well, I think... I think both of them are French. Uh, it's <laughs> well, actually no well cv is latin, latin yeah i think what michael limba's saying kind of answers ishan's question in that i think it is regional because in the uk at least we normally say cv yeah um it is mostly cv here and i think resume resume kind of used in lots of other countries as well it's basically the same thing you know like uh, as far as your tech uh, job application goes if they say send your CV or resume, it basically means one, two pages of your work history. Yeah, there might be some technical um, difference between the two of them. But, but nobody cares about them. Yeah, they're kind <laughs> of widely understood to be the same thing. Yeah, I have never been in, in in a position where, you know, somebody said, oh, no, they send a resume instead of a CV. Um, I don't think anybody actually <laughs> knows what the difference is. Yeah, and you don't necessarily have to put it on the top. This is my yeah. resume, do you? So, yes. No, exactly. You don't put the uh, the title of it. You just say your name and go ahead. Ishan's also wondering, what are the typical tech brands in a front-end dev role? You've touched on this. Can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, most, well, to be fair, front-end, back-end, uh, all the tech brands will be exactly the same uh, for most of the job. It's like the content of those tech brands will be a little bit different because the actual uh tech test or uh something like that will be either generic or it would be front end specific and that was pretty much the only difference and then uh when it comes to discussing your experiences obviously you'll you'll be asked questions like tell us when you build something for lots of users you know or maybe tell us when you know basically they'll try to get experience out of building front ends uh or just a little bit more targeted towards the front end. But the absolute, the absolute structure of everything will be exactly the same. Uh, so you apply with your CV, uh, people look at it, they then invite you to a phone interview, which, uh, well, nowadays is just a Zoom. Or sometimes it is a phone. If they're based in the same country, they will call you up for like 15 minutes, maybe. Um, they basically just want to know you're real. Uh, they want to know that you know, just basic screening, motivation, that kind of thing. Um, usually, if you don't display any red flags, you will sail through the phone interview. So that's kind of, it's still, I would call it like still a CV stage. Uh, and then after that, you will be handed over to uh, probably engineering team for a review, and they will say, prepare for those interviews. So the rounds would be, uh, could be soft skills, uh, tech test. Again, they will be in different order for different companies because certain companies value, like they want to know that you can code before they bring in to talk to you about soft skills. But some people say, we want to tell you more about the company. We want to learn more about you as a person and only then give you a tech test. Hmm. Uh, so it depends on what companies value more. Uh, and then after those two, you will usually have like a round with a uh, CTO or engineer manager, depending on the size of the company uh, that you will have a chat with. And then maybe some other rounds, maybe another tech uh, or maybe a pair coding question um, or take home test. 
And then after that, hopefully, you'll get an offer. Lovely. Have it. hope that helps. Cool. A question now on career changing. What tips can you give for people who are changing their career? I'm mm -hmm. a structural engineer with 10 years experience. Yep. I want to get into web dev. So okay. it sounds a bit like what you had. You were in engineering. Yes, I was a mechanical engineer. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, what tips can I give you? So I would say that you, in terms of uh, transferable skills, you're pretty much there because you can very much, very easily in the interview relate to saying, look, I worked as an engineer, this is engineering. And then you can just talk about approaching problem solving uh, and stuff like that. So, you know, how do you go about uh, bringing a business value? You know, structural engineers, I would imagine that you have somewhat relevant skills in that regard where you still have a problem that needs to be solved and how do you go about solving it and i talk about constraints you know picking uh the right balance um and stuff like that apart from that i would say that obviously the main the main style like the main elephant in the room is like you don't have professional experience coding so how can you compensate that and you can compensate that by saying that you have job skills that are very easily transferable, that the company will not have to spend resources. So, you know, if you're a fresh graduate, the company, like, yeah, you might know how to code a, a little bit, but the company still will need to teach you how to work in a team, how to work with, uh, you know, shipping software, delivering stuff, how to keep the quality bar up. Uh, and most of the time, they'll probably have to unteach you bad habits that you might have picked up at university. They don't have to do any of it if you are transitioning from a career because your previous employer already spent that money teaching you how to work in a team, teaching you how to work with clients and stuff like that. So all of that, they save a lot of money. So if you just point to that, that's already a massive set of point. And like learning a programming language, most companies consider somewhat trivial. They know that you can probably do it. Because the thing that's kind of nice about software is that it's always changing and evolving and new technologies are coming up. So in a way, Pretty much. everyone has to start again every five years or whatever. Pretty so much. not really on the back foot in that regard. I mean, yeah, the, the way we built React applications five years ago is very different to building React applications today. Um, mm -hmm. And probably in five years, it will be different again. So even though the, even the technology and name hasn't changed, but lots of other stuff has changed. Um, question here. When you see that a job has more than 100 applications, would you still apply for it? Yes. Can you tell us more? Uh, I, uh, a lot of people ask these questions by hundreds of applications, but, you know, it, I kind of have a suspicion that it's like, you know, when you go to like a hotel booking website or airplane ticket booking website or like a sale product. Only they one say, room left at this exactly, price. Exactly. <laughs> one room left at this price or only five products left or three more customers are looking at this room right now. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I always thought that it's uh, not really true. It's probably a scam. And quite often, like, you can go to DevTools and you can see that actually uh, it's like uh, it did with a timer in it. So it, it's not actually real. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think that doesn't really apply to, like, hotel booking websites and stuff. I think that applies to, like... Um, I don't know, like uh, marketing, marketing courses <laughs> or like become, become a real estate developer in seven day course, that kind of thing. I think that is genuinely, there is a time on the webpage. But um, having said that, you know, do you know if that's real? If it's not, maybe it's more than hundred. Maybe it's like LinkedIn says it's a hundred, but for Indeed.com there's another hundred. You don't know how many people applied. But also what is quite likely is that a lot of people click the button they applied, they moved on, they forgot about it. If you genuinely want that job and you have tailored your CV and you're ready to stand out, obviously you'll get to the top of a pile. So I think that's the thing, especially if they've got the easy apply thing on. Yes, they may have a hundred applications, but many yeah. of them are going to be fairly low quality. And if yours isn't, then yeah. you're going to stand out. Exactly. So you, that's where you know you might write a cover letter again ChatGPT probably can help you out with that but don't forget to just make it personalized like i know that most of that gump is going to be very generic but you still put uh because you can't just say like i really like the job xyz 
Uh, I really enjoy that. But to be fair, again, like if you go to their website and you get the feel from the company that they would appreciate just a bullet point of things while you're applying, just do that. No, don't go to ChatGPT. If you're applying for like a big corporate, uh, I don't know, some kind of like consultancy firm, their HI is probably trained to screen things according to their procedure and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can't just write a quick bullet list why you will want to work for a big four uh, consulting company. Uh, but if it's a small startup, um, yeah, don't waste their time. Write a couple of sentences. Hey, I found this very interesting. I enjoyed this. I did something similar. Uh, would like, would love to have a chat. Thank you. Less that? is more. Yeah. <laughs> Tailor it to the actual people that you want to hear. Maybe go to LinkedIn and write them a message saying, hey, um, I'm probably one of the hundreds that applied. But, you know. Uh, Definitely doesn't hurt, yeah, to exactly. get sort of um, some kind of rapport going and just get your name and face kind of recognizable to the company. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a very interesting book that I read. Uh, it was called Cold Email for Interesting People. Uh, give it, give it a read. Uh, it will give you a couple of ideas how to reach out to people who have no idea about your existence. And sometimes it works out, but sometimes it's like, well. That's kind of the whole point of cold calling, emailing, applying, that kind of thing. But you're not doing it because somebody recommended you. It's a little bit harder. Obviously, it's easier if you have a network and stuff like that. But I'm sure, pretty sure we're going to cover that part a little bit later. But for if you're cold applying, you need to stand out from the crowd. And the way you do it is you go an extra couple of steps compared to the rest of the people who apply as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Mohammed's wondering, what is the right thing to do for students who have no experience? Which Ooh. brings me on to, yeah. yes. Exactly that question I wanted so to ask. So the students... Um, presenting academic projects or coursework for your first tech job, for example. Yeah. And um, how can you compensate for a lack of professional tech experience on a resume? Yeah, so um, lack of professional experience for on for a resume is obviously a little bit different for self-taught people and students who study CS, like computer science or software engineering or anything like that. You know, if you're self-taught, you need to find transferable skills. If you are a CS student, then you need to show that you have done coursework and you need to show, you know, your grades. Kind of like, if you have all, all the Ds across the board, uh, it will be harder to send out. So I'll probably just hide those and just try to show off your project and stuff. Because again, like you can get a mark that's not reflecting of your knowledge. Or maybe, you know, you just uh, had some, I don't know, family problems and didn't really study that year. You got a bad mark, but you have actually learned the stuff. So now you might know it. So in that case, yeah, just try to show off your GitHub, your contributions, your maybe through university you have managed to contribute to some open source projects. Maybe they're university open source projects. Uh, so do, do talk about them, list them on your CV, uh, make them discoverable, and then, uh, yeah, mention them. Ishan's wondering, what should be the order if you have no experience? Should you put your projects at the top, for example? Yes. So you put to the top the most relevant to the job thing. So if you don't have any actual job experience or university projects, so like if you do, if you're a student and you have a CS degree, you put your degree on the top and then you put the projects. If you don't have a CS degree and you're self-taught, then you put your projects and then you put your like transferable job experience skills and then you put your education. Um, kind of like that, you know, you put the most relevant thing to the top, like who you are and why you fit the job. And then it kind of goes in the order of less relevance. Good stuff. Yeah, which is why you should list like, you know, tech things that you can do. You know, if you know React, you list that. If you know Next, you list that. So you list from left to right, the most complex and relevant to the easiest and kind of understandable. You know, like obviously don't list Microsoft Word, Excel, Google Sheets, that kind of thing, because no. your employers, 
expect you to know Google Sheets. <laughs> so, so this brings me on to how to list tech skills on a resume. How should you actually format that? Because you see various different things, don't you? You see logos of like React and JS. You see those progress bars. Mm. What actually works? So I would probably say uh, if you tailor it, you can have two, three, four different uh, CVs that you have. You know, you can have like a fancy CV with logos and things that you apply to small companies with. Uh, reason being that the bigger the company or you apply through a recruitment company, they will not care about any of that formatting because all they care about is data in your CV. You know, can they extract the keywords and rank you and save you in some database that when they search that database, your name comes up. That's yeah. all. So you don't want to have just the logo and not actually write it in text. Exactly. <laughs> you might be filtered out by mistake. Exactly, because uh, all those logos, they might not get scanned properly, and then your CV will be empty. Uh, so you know, keep the fancy, cool-looking CVs for uh, smaller companies to apply for, the ones that will definitely look at it and appreciate it. And uh, you know, it's a human who, who reads them, not the machine. You know, So basically, if it's like, Apply through this email and it's like tom at startup.com. Hmm. He'll probably read it. Uh, but if it's more about like recruitment at uh, company.com, then it's probably going to be just passed first and then they will see you in some kind of application recruitment system. Uh, so, yeah, do it accordingly. So, fancy CVs, small companies, and plain looking, but lots of data CVs are for other companies. And those, again, as I mentioned, most relevant stuff at the top, least relevant stuff at the bottom, and then left to right, again, like when you are writing a couple of lines about things you can do, you know, if you can do Node or like C Sharp, uh, you know, whatever languages, you know, list them, then list frameworks, and then, you know, you can write Git, and then in the end, you can write something that, you know, HTML, CSS, that kind of thing. Sometimes people struggle with knowing how much you need to know in order to honestly list a skill on your CV. And what I mean is mm -hmm. how can you know? Yes, I know enough React that I can confidently slap it on there. Well, right. So, again, you know, have you written something? If they ask you, okay, look, we have this feature and you need to create it in React. Do you think you'll be somewhat realistically able to, with suck overflow documentation, you know, GitHub examples and stuff, pull something together in that ecosystem? So, for example, I am not React expert or Next.js expert, but if somebody asks me to do something in it, I'll try to hobble something together and I'll definitely try. I'll, I'll probably get the job done to a certain extent. If somebody asks me to do it in Angular, I'll just straight up say I've never written a single line. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah, I guess so you could also look at the product they already have, and if you feel like you could build some of the features of that yeah. in whatever technology, then you probably have a good chance. Exactly. Like, for example, I... Actually, no, I, I, I have lied. I do have CSS on my CV, but I don't know. Um, but I think because HTML CSS kind of... Uh, people expect that you will know some of it to an extent. So yeah, if you at least written something, uh, you have something on your GitHub in that technology, uh, and it's not just a hello world example, but a little <laughs> bit more involved, uh, then you can probably add it to your, add it to your CV. Yeah. Let's put it this way: like if you if they ask you and you embarrass yourself during an interview, uh, you, to you take it off. <laughs> you will then. I can guarantee you will go to that to your CV and remove it after that. Oh, you're it's going fine. to learn it. Yeah, or you will learn it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, Meek is wondering, if a job application has an optional field to write a cover letter, should you write it? Oh, again, previously, I would say no, screw that. Uh, nobody writes cover letters anymore. Uh, but nowadays, probably, yeah, probably it would be a good idea. Yeah, definitely. Again, it, it's just yet another chance to sign up. Mm. If 100 applicants and 99 of them haven't included the cover letter, just simply by the virtue of you are the only one being that person, you will stand out a little bit. So yeah, go for it. Yeah. Food tech life. 
When tailoring a CV for a specific job, are mm -hmm. you looking to match their soft skills mostly? Uh, I'm looking to match pretty much. I'm, I'm looking to match their job spec on the website to my CV. So whoever looks at my CV and looks at that job spec and they go, oh my God, there's so much matching in this. This is great. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I'm looking. Uh, if they say, you know, team worker, uh, you know, one of my previous experiences will include, you know, worked in team of five or something. Or like, uh, even better if you said that, you know, you have some kind of leading experience in that team. You know, like, for example, you uh, taught people how to use a piece of software or something uh, in that team. Then, yeah, of course you're a team worker. You even managed to, like, take on board stuff and actually teach somebody to do stuff with it. So, yeah. And then in terms of uh, hard skills, yeah, uh, you should probably look to match most of the stuff. I mean, I'm not saying all the stuff because sometimes people list like uh, some kind of Oracle database mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And uh, maybe you've never worked with it. Then obviously don't include it. You know, if, if they look for like PostgreSQL uh, and you worked with MS SQL, you can probably include it. Um, just don't forget to very briefly read through, you know, what are the main differences between the two so you don't get caught out. Uh, but again, you know, these, technologies that are more or less transferable. When I've been applying to jobs in the past, sometimes when I'm doing this matching exercise, it can feel a bit contrived. So yes. you know, there's <laughs> your example, needs a team worker. I'm definitely a team worker. <laughs> Is that the best approach? Ah, because so, you kind of want to be subtle so it doesn't seem Exactly, to so, uh, so that's why you can probably look through, again, like uh, what are the values on the company and uh, what they have listed on the job spec. And then obviously, if they say that uh, we're looking for, uh, you know, team players, you know, you don't want to say team player, but you do want to include an experience that would cover that aspect. And you preferably you don't use the exact wording as well, because that would be a bit too, you know, on the nose. Yeah. So well, I think it's better to err on the side of being... Too yeah, be subtle, too you know? Too much of a copycat, you know? Yes. You want to say exact same thing as what they're asking, but with different words. They're not too different. Yes. <laughs> I think it's better to be kind of obvious about it if you're in doubt. Hmm. Any advice, asks Tim Dehoff, on how to translate your experiences from a previous job to a new tech role I've been just yes. searching for a year. Can't get an interview anyway. Okay, uh, I think in that case, uh, yeah, so CV writing is probably, well, oh, you say that you were job searching, so depends how many CVs you have had, you know, so have you applied for 100 jobs and 20 of them called you back, then probably your CV is fine. Uh, I would look into other skills, uh, but if you, for example, applied for 100, heard nothing back, then definitely look into that CV. In terms of uh, transferable skills, uh, mechanical engineer, software development. So, you know, I was a mechanical engineer and now I'm a software engineer. So transferable skills are very straightforward. You, as a mechanical engineer, you have to work in highly compliance rich environment. Uh, there are lots of standards. Uh, you have to adhere to very rigorous processes and stuff. So a lot of that is very transferable. Uh, you are used quite likely to work in, um, you know, security heavy environments maybe. Uh, maybe it's uh, health and safety assessments and uh, stuff like that. So you basically, you look after security, you look after, and like code security is applicable as well. Um, so you process oriented and uh, things like that. And also, you know, your project management skills in mechanical engineering are directly transferable to software engineering because uh, yeah, everything, you know, all of these Japanese manufacturing techniques that we have been learning about, uh, software use, is using them, kind of. They've stolen the names, but, you know, and kind of stripped the actual contents, but they're somewhat applicable, like uh, Kanban and Andon Chords and uh, all of those uh, other Toyota branded things that mechanical engineers love talking about. Yeah, software is using them as well. So, yeah, all of that is very transferable. Point being is, 
if you're not a mechanical engineer, if you're transferring from any other career, you know, research, like, what's the lingo that software is using? Read the blog post about how was it like to work as a software engineer, you know? And then once you know that roughly, uh, it will give you a better idea of what you can actually transfer. Because I think the main problem is that people don't really know what software engineering involves, so they don't really know what to match against their current job. So try to research what the job actually involves. You know, watch these YouTube videos about day in life of software engineer, but obviously not the ones that, you know, just show you a bike ride to work and then bike ride back home. Uh, but more like, um, what is it like to work there? What do people actually do? What problems they face uh, and stuff like that. Maybe there are a couple of books that I can think of. Um, no, actually, I can't think of any books. I haven't, I haven't read any. Um, I think the point you made about um, identifying the part where your application isn't progressing and working on that yes. is a really good point. Because, as you said, if your CV is getting through, but it's the phone interview that's not getting passed, yeah. perhaps, yeah, I don't, don't doubt there's YouTube videos about how to ace the phone interview or Yeah, exactly. Whatever so focus on the things is. that are the weakest uh, yeah. in this link. So, but if your CV and you need transferable skills, then you can list those as well. Um, I think there was, oh no, those books are elsewhere. Also. Oh, the Phoenix Project. I think that's like one of, mm. uh, and as a mechanical engineer, it's a copy of this other book that we um, usually read. Can't remember the name of it now. But yeah, the Phoenix Project. And uh, yeah. you can give it a read. And um, also, See if you can find an area that kind of blends the two fields together. So I don't know how applicable this might be with mechanical engineering, but if we have teachers that are learning to code, we recommend that they look into ed tech companies. So perhaps you can use some of the skills and experience you already have. And um, yeah, get in that way. But good, best of luck. Anyway. Oh, yeah, it's a uh, gold rat, I think, basically. There was this mechanical engineering book from the bloke called Goldrat about uh, processes and stuff and improving it. And then somebody created the inspired book uh, called Phoenix Project. So I think if you're going into software, you can just go straight to that Phoenix Project book. Yes, sir. Code by Kelvin. Yeah. I was told, don't wait until I think I'm ready to start applying yes. while in the learning process. That's something we always say. Yes. Yeah. Um, what do you feel I should know? Uh, to be confident before Ooh. applying. So we do always recommend don't wait until you think you're ready because what is ready, really? Um, right. <laughs> it's a status yeah. that's very difficult to reach, I think. So we always say just give it a go and best case scenario, you'll get hired. If not, you'll get tips on the skills that you need yeah. to build up. But how, obviously you need to know something. How can you know when to start? Well, I think uh, that's kind of problem that most people see is you know you will not uh all of a sudden feel more confident and that confidence will magically mean that you are really good at interviewing mm -hmm. uh you know if anything poor interviewing skills with high amount of confidence actually correlate very poorly in interview uh because it it will show like you're a bit cocky or something you know if you're really confident mm -hmm. but have poor interviewing skills that's not a great match so you need to build your interviewing skills with your level of confidence, you know, so you need to be able to articulate what value you bring to the company and why they should hire you in eloquent, straightforward, uh, friendly way. Uh, and all of that is because you're confident in your skills and how you interview. And the only way you do it is by interviewing. You know, there is no, there is no other way. It, it will suck. It will be painful. Um, it would be embarrassing at times, uh, but you will get better and better the more you do it, which is why we always say, you know, start interviewing earlier so you make all of the mistakes when you're not really ready as such, you know. It's kind of live practice sessions. Exactly. Because you can do as many practice interviews as possible, but they won't really translate into a real life experience when, you know, there's a job potentially on the line there. So, yeah, and often you have to pay for the practice ones, whereas the real ones are free. And the real ones are free, I said yeah. it should be, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, uh, that's probably a tip that, you know, scam alert. Uh, if at any point they ask you to pay for the interview in process, 
That's a scam. Mm-hmm. Okay, just, just <laughs> yeah. don't pay for it. Uh, the point of a job is that people pay you money, not the other way around. I mean, you say it, it will be painful and embarrassing. I mean, it might not be. It might not be. I mean, it, again, like if you are, uh, like if you already have like five, ten years in your existing career, then obviously you can transfer those interview and skills into another career. So you'll probably be pretty good. Definitely, interviewing is something that gets easier the more you do it. So, yeah. yeah, I think like if you are transitioning from tech recruiting into being a software engineering job, then probably interviewing will be the easiest right. part for you. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, <laughs> and if something embarrassing does happen in an interview, believe me, I speak from experience when I say it makes yeah. great stories later on. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. But I had some interviews. Like, <laughs> I always say it. Uh, I would after the interview, I finish the Zoom and I would come into this office next to Leon and I would just lie down on the floor. It was that bad. I went to an interview and realized halfway through that I had toothpaste down my jacket. Oh, no. So you know, <laughs> it can't be worse than that. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it's a funny story to tell people in the pub. Or on a live stream. Yeah. Is a portfolio website essential for an entry-level dev position? If so, how many projects should... Um, oh, this is another question. How many projects should an entry-level mm-hmm. dev have on the CV? Let's start with a portfolio. With a portfolio, if you... Uh, well, I would say yes. So if you're applying for a front-end role, your portfolio, obviously, the, the bar for your portfolio is a little bit higher than if you're applying for, like, infrastructure or back-end jobs. Uh, then your portfolio can be very, very straightforward with just links to things that you've built. Um, in terms of CV, uh, list, you know, three, four, five most impactful projects that you had and, you know, how you built them, what you've learned, and link to them link or with a link to them at least you know is it a deployed link and if it is a deployed link to the project then at the bottom of that project there should be a link to github so i want to be able to go from your cv to your github to your project or from your cv to your project to your github mm-hmm. you know full circle uh so yeah definitely link it that way Portfolio. Do you think it's important to have both actually because if you only have your github then what they're going to download it and like I don't know. So in, on GitHub, when you go to GitHub on the right hand side, there is like a link you can paste to yeah. Netlify or something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you should definitely have both. So do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or include link in the readme. Basically, when you in GitHub, there should be a link to the thing. What it looks like. Where's it? Where does it look like working? Mm. Um, and if it's like a project that, for example, is on, it's meant to run on a Raspberry Pi or something. Obviously, you can't link to Netlify there. Uh, so you can probably link instructions on how to recreate it or try to find some Raspberry Pi emulator that they can link that you can link to in that case. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the, point, the main idea is that you can go from your CV to your code to running code. That's proof. Uh, remember at the beginning of the call, we were saying everybody cares whether you can ship and uh, that kind of proof is in the pudding. You know, you link to your code and there it runs. You prove that mm-hmm. what you write can be shipped. Cool. Good stuff. Awesome. Um, trying to get through as many questions as possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, quick fire round. How can I tailor my CV to land a junior developer role? Uh, you look at the job spec and you make sure that your CV is like the perfect candidate for that job spec. Stuff. Yeah. So as I said, you know, with ChatGPT, soft skills and hard skills. Yeah, with ChatGPT plus your review, you you know maybe the first application will take you an hour or two, but the more you do them, the you'll probably get your time down to like half an hour. Yeah, because like a lot of the work's already done basically. Yeah, because you will you will get into the flow and you will have like a pipeline on how to do it. You know, multiple tabs open, right? Bam, bam, bim. It should be good. Yeah. I heard uh, for a junior dev, you should keep your CV to one page. I've also seen CVs with a vertical split layout. Is there an ideal layout to use? A vertical split? What do you mean? I think like two columns. When I've spoken uh, to um, recruiters previously, um, yeah, you can check them out in this playlist here, Ask an Expert. They have yeah. strongly recommended to do a single column layout because it's easier to read. Because recruiters upload your CV to 
mm. somewhere yeah. else. That's the other and thing, yeah. uh, it's quite likely that whatever formatting you came up with, it will be broken. As I said, keep fancy CVs to small startups, individual applications, you know. Uh, if you know that that CV will be read, read by a human and somebody will actually look at it and appreciate it, then send it, send the fancy one. If you're in town, single column, black and white, minimum fonts, uh, like italics, bold, and uh, regular font, that kind of thing. You know, nothing too fancy. And what about the one page thing? Is that... Um, is that what you expect as a hiring manager? No, not really. I mean, if it's like five pages, that would be like, oh, really? I would say maximum two is what's realistically yeah. going to be. Yeah, if you can't yeah. make it, <laughs> look, if you try to write it and it doesn't fit on one page, just make it two. Honestly, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Two is acceptable. <laughs> it doesn't matter, yeah. It's... More than two, it would be a little bit odd. Uh, because you can perfectly fit like a decade of experience on two pages. Uh, but yeah, uh, trying to scram it into one, why? Like make things a little bit freer and empty and stuff like that. I think people generally accept that two is okay. Yeah. yeah. Anna, Ian, Ian, sorry. <laughs> How important is it to have a degree nowadays? I'm um, migrating from uh -huh. the design world. And I feel no more harmony because I don't have a degree in systems. Well, I think having a background in design is a very yeah. positive yeah, exactly. aspect with a lot of crossover. Um, so you can definitely make the most of that. Any degree requirement is very easily superseded with professional work experience. Mm. And if you have worked in design, especially, which is very uh, adjacent career, yeah. So if you were creating UX design patterns and now you want to be a developer, you don't need a degree. You you just need to learn how to code. You need the proof that you have shipped a couple of projects and you have them on GitHub and that's it. Just go for it. Um, nobody's going to care about your degree. Yeah. I think you're in a really good position actually because yeah. there's often this kind of conflict between designers and developers because they want different things and work in different ways and if you can understand both sides of the table yeah. you're going to be a really good asset to a company so best of luck with your applications there yeah absolutely is a reference in a resume important do hr really check uh so at the bottom of your resume just write or your cv at the bottom just write references available on request and that's it yeah I actually don't think you should put the full contact details on your CV. Exactly. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, provide them if they're requested later down the line. Yes. Does that often happen? Um, for a junior role, maybe. Also, depending on your country. I know that some people... Mm. I heard some that some countries even do your credit score for your for your job application. Um, but, again, it depends on your country, uh, if you're in America, in, on your state as well, or, I, so yeah, I can't really say, but universal advice, uh, don't include actual references and names and what a great person you are. Just write references available on request and that's it. Okay. And if they ask, they ask. If they don't, they don't. Any advice is lucky victory. For someone who does a non-tech related job, but has tech skills and would love to earn with it. Uh, any advice for someone who does non-tech related uh, yeah, you can either try to focus on getting a full-time job or you can freelance. Uh, so if you've been freelancing, then definitely leverage that experience to get a full-time job if that's your goal. Uh, but in terms of advice, maybe maybe you can be a little bit more specific, like what kind of area of advice are you looking for? Uh, you know, professional development or job application, that kind of thing. Yes, I like the idea of freelancing. I think it sounds... Like it's quite an intimidating thing to get into. Then yeah, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, uh, but honestly, I can uh, probably not the best person to talk about freelance because I haven't really done much of it. Well, uh, you say that, but that's how you got involved in Scrim. Well, that's true, but it's, it's just, like it's not called freelancing. It's just I doing guess. stuff on the side for a company you know about. Yeah, uh, but like you know, I've never had uh, multiple clients that I would work with, and like you know job evaluations, uh, you know, like, oh, what kind of website do you tell me about your business, that kind of thing. Um, 
So, but in that way, you know, I think fundamentally the things are, you know, what, what, what is your client trying to achieve and how can you help them achieve it? Um, and I think if you can do it, if you can focus on that thing, then that would be good. Well, but then also there is like a payment, you know, how do you, do you get fairly paid for that freelance job? But I think you're probably better off watching specific YouTube advice on that <laughs> from somebody who actually done that. Is that... Leonard, mm -hmm. I've been applying for jobs for more than a year now. I don't get an interview. I believe I have a good CV. Most replies okay. I get are that I have no experience. How's best to tackle that situation? Ah, okay. So, uh, you have been applying for jobs, oh, but you don't even get interviews and they say they're on your CV. So basically the only reason they can tell that, that you have no experience is that looking at your CV, they can't see any experience. So that to me tells that maybe your CV is structured well, but it lacks proof in it that even though you don't have professional experience, you already have coding experience. And that's basically what you need to prove. You need to make that link. Yes. So can you ship? Here is how you can ship. And you link CV, projects, GitHub, actual links to work on projects. Yes. Time for one final question. Sure. Trend guards. Okay. I'm a self-taught web developer. My previous job was completely unrelated to tech. Okay. Should I put that on my CV? Yeah, sure. Well, what's the... Yeah, you know, what, what's the job? Uh, but whatever it is, if it has any transferable skills, and to be fair, any job probably will have some transferable skills. Yeah, you can link it. Yeah, I think so. I remember this um, experience. I guess we got told about um, one Scrimba student had been a zookeeper for thirty years, and yeah. they managed to link their skills from zookeeping into web dev. So yeah, I'm sure that there are some transferable skills you can bring on over to your any, CV. Any, any job has some, like software engineering is a very all-encompassing, um, because whatever you touch nowadays has something to do with software. Yeah. Uh, there is some kind of, you know, you go to the park or something like that, there is something to do with software. So there is some link to to it. You can You can try to find it. Brilliant. Um, that's all we have time for. An hour has flown on past. Thank you oh, for well. all your wonderful questions. Yeah, thank you very much. That was, that was fun. Apologies if we didn't get a chance to answer them all, but we will be doing more career-focused live streams yes. very soon. And you can also go to Scrimba Discord, and there is a channel called Career Chat, where I usually answer stuff uh, as well. So, uh, and yes, lots of do. other people. Um, Let's find the old link for that. Yes. Discord URLs. Here we are. There we go. So yeah, join it's our Discord cool. and you can Discord. chat about all of these things as well. Ask ask the same questions and uh, you know if you need any clarifications, let me know. Lovely. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and answering uh, all these questions, Michael. And no, thank you for having me. We'll be having another stream in a couple of weeks' time, so look out on our YouTube page. It will appear at some point. Yes. Right here. <laughs> okay, thanks for watching and see you next time. <laughs>